there, fellow Star Wars nerds, and welcome to Unlimited Content, the <laughs> podcast where two brothers talk about all of Star Wars film and TV in chronological order on the internet as an excuse to hang out more. We're your hosts, Sam and Jack, and this week we're talking about The Clone Wars, Season 2, Episodes 20 through 22, Death Trap, R2 Come Home, and Lethal Trackdown. Sam, I think we're both feeling a little bit tired. This I'm, week. Sweepy. Um, I'm sweepy. I'm sweepy. Yeah. Indeed. How you doing? Yep. Uh, sweepy. Oh, good. <laughs> I think it's. I think for me, it's just been the. It's been the cold. We've had a, a big old cold front throughout the U.S. this week. Yep. Uh, this past week or so. Um, here in Austin, we were, uh, below freezing for a few days, th- like earlier this week, and then we got another cold front later in the week, and it got cold again. Uh, not quite as bad, but um, luckily there were no like big power outages or anything, and I don't. I don't think i haven't had any i didn't hear about anybody like losing water or, or power or anything mm-hmm. but it was it was just real cold yeah <laughs> it was just I feel that you know i was I, yeah i was talking to one of my friends being like like on on tuesday i messaged my friends being like it feels like it's thursday already it feels like it should be thursday but it's tuesday <laughs> and, yeah yeah and when I, one of my friends was like yeah the cold just it it elongates time it does it's, oh my gosh yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. um, I heard uh, things were uh, worse for you though. <laughs> You've had a rough, rough week, haven't it's you? It's been it's been a bit. I'll tell you what. Yeah. Um. So up in Kansas City, it has uh, been substantially colder than it was in Austin. Surprise, surprise. This happens to you go ten hours north. Um. But yeah, it was been in the negatives pretty steadily. But there were a couple days that never got <laughs> above zero. Um. And. The Kansas City Fort House is a drafty old house that does not keep up with heat, and our water pipes froze for a while. We didn't, nothing burst or anything. Um, I just went down to the basement and checked. I have no burst pipes or nothing. But we're back after having been at my in-laws for like eight days uh, because their house stays warm and their water runs. So that's nice. Th- those, those are perks. Those, those are perks. perks. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> being not in your own home, not of your own choosing for eight days and then to come home and the water's still not running is awesome. That's why I am so energetic right now. So much energy, so much vigor, so much life. <laughs> I feel great. Vim and vigor. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So uh, that's what's going on here. I just reported to the city that we have no water. And there's no leaks in the house. So I don't know what's going on. Not happy because it's already it's it was above freezing for a good part of the day today, so nothing should be amiss. So I don't know what's going on, but here we are. Oh man, my water bill is not as high as I thought it was going to be, which is good. That way, all the sponsor money that we're going to get, I can actually put to use. Jack, how am I going to pay my water bill this month? Yes. How am I going to do it? Uh, well, you're going to pay your water bill this month with our unlimited sponsor. Uh, this week's episode of the content is brought to you by centralized heating. <laughs> oh, that's nice, especially when it works. <laughs> yes, the, yeah. Our, this week's episode of the week content is brought to you by functioning centralized heating, mm. <laughs> specifically the functioning. Variety. Yeah, so not mine. Got it. Yeah, well, it works now. Yeah. Well, now that it's it above, is now. now that, yeah, now that it's above freezing and the temperature starts to the three. And it ends with another number that's not after a decimal point. We're gonna be okay. So, but other than that, it's not good. Yeah, we're we're gonna move <laughs> after this. Our lease is up here because we don't want this is two winters in a row. We've been put out of house and home by the cold, which is not that's what good. should happen. So, probably gonna move again in a couple months. By couple, I mean like Thanksgiving when our lease is up. So we got time. Gotcha, but. Uh, uh, fun. Anyway, Jack, how have you been surviving the cold? Uh, other than like your centralized heating working, what have you been entertaining yeah, yourself luckily. with? <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, um, not a whole lot to talk about this week, which is good because I'm we're both tired and <laughs> we have three episodes to talk about. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll talk about two things. One is um, the first uh, like significant video game release of the year, at least for me mm-hmm. uh was this past week um was it the bible game the new prince of persia game oh. it was not the, it was not the <laughs> bible game 
for Game Boy Advance. <laughs> uh, no, there's uh, the, the new Prince of Persia game come out. Ooh. This week. Prince of Persia: The, the Lost Crown. Um, it's the first new Prince of Persia game, and then I think like 14 years. Whoa! I think the last one was like 2010. Um, and that one started Jake Gyllenhaal, so this, right? This franchise has been. <laughs> well, that, that was this. Yeah, so the, the last Prince of Persia game came out the same year that we got the Jake Gyllenhaal Prince of Persia movie. So there it is. It's, yeah, <laughs> noted Persian Jake Gyllenhaal. Yes. Noted, <laughs> noted Persian Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, um, but uh, yeah, this this latest game it's uh, it's a a two D side scrolling game rather than a three D one. Um, going back to kind of the series roots, it's, it's very it's very good. I've I've been enjoying it so far. It's got really good like it's it's a Metroidvania, so it's like a side scrolling platforming action game that focuses on exploration and you know, finding you know, expanding areas of the map and, and getting new abilities and stuff. I and, love those kind of games. Uh, They're so fun. Yes. I love a good Metroidvania. It's it's such a yeah. I just realized why I it's called it. a Metroidvania game. It's because that's how Metroid works. And I guess that's also probably how Castlevania works. And therefore yes. that's just I yeah. I didn't realize that was the name <laughs> of that genre of game. I just like well, now you I've know, heard the yeah. term Metroidvania. I'm just like, well, I know what Metroid is, so it's probably like that. And I guess it is. But that's cool. I didn't realize that was a genre other than just like I thought in my head there was like some weird Metroid Castlevania crossover game that I'd never heard of before. <laughs> that I could Metroidvania. Never... I mean, I don't <laughs> yeah. I didn't know, but it, I... No no no, yeah, that's yeah. it totally reasonable conclusion to come to. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um no yeah, it's it's yeah. Yeah, you're right. Metroidvania comes from Metroid, the Metroid series, and also Castlevania, but specifically Castlevania Symphony of the Night, which was a PS1 game. Mm -hmm. It was one of the later Castlevania games, because, like, the earlier Castlevania games were mostly, like, linear. Like, you know, just kind of going left to right, fighting enemies kind of thing. Like a Mario game, um, or, the yeah. or the Adventure of Link. Zelda 2. Yes. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, with, with Symphony of the Night, they kind of did a, like, they... they reconfigured the the game to be a little more about exploration and, hmm. and stuff and so like those are kind of the like that and super metroid are kind of the two like games that established this genre and that everything else kind of borrows from um but yeah uh so the new prince of persia is a, is a very good metroidvania so far this is what i've played um it's got a really like cool like stylish uh bright art style um almost kind of anime inspired ish um and it's it's very uh it's very focused on combat definitely the, the combat's like very kind of involved and fast-paced and there's dodges and parries and special moves you gotta unlock and it's it's difficult but it's it's very good i'm enjoying it a lot um so yeah definitely uh highly recommend if that sounds like something up your alley uh it's on most platforms i think nice um does most then, include switch uh, I I think so, yeah. Hey, I, so. I can play that then. That's fun. Yeah. So, uh, yes, definitely enjoying that. Um, and then the other thing uh, that I did this week, media wise, is I watched uh, John Mulaney's most recent comedy special, Baby J. Was it seen this? Sam? I've heard of it. Is it good? It's really good. I liked it a lot. Yeah. Um, I was kind. Of, so this came out like April of last year, and I just hadn't watched it until then. Um, but I, I was kind of. I, I think just because of all the stuff that has been going on with him in his personal life, you know, like, yeah, I, I was like, I don't know if I want to watch his latest comedy special because I just I don't know what he's I don't know. Um, well, but it turns out it was really good because he so like if if you're not aware, listener, uh, John Mulaney went through some stuff. Yeah, what, the, <laughs> the one, the one listener, the one listener, not listener, <laughs> just listener. Hey, you don't know. <laughs> we could have we could have twice the listeners this week as we usually do. We could have two. <laughs> Um, yeah, John Mulaney, John Mulaney, comedian, former writer for Saturday Night Live and whatnot, um, had a several very successful comedy specials that are on Netflix, and uh, his most recent one is also on Netflix. Um, but over, over the last few years, he like uh, he went into rehab for addiction to various drugs, <laughs> including cocaine, um, and he like I think went through a divorce, and he also had a kid, and mm -hmm. it's you know it's a whole thing. Um, yeah, that all happened like so, a year. Divorce uh, and a kid with another woman, and then married that woman, like all in the course of like yeah. a year. It was like, oh, yeah. It was like, wow, that was buddy. What's, what's going on? Here? What what you doing? Yeah. But it, it was honestly like uh, his latest special, Baby J, um, is he basically talks about all of that. Hmm. The, the comedy special is about his experience, like 
uh, you know, being a drug addict and then having his friends like stage an intervention and then him going to rehab and then like w- you know what life is like post having been through rehab and kind of just you know he's very like like frank and open about the whole thing and, yeah but it's, it's like because he's you know he's john Mulaney, he's very you know he's a smart funny guy he, like it, he tells the story in a way that feels very like you know it, it's sincere but it's still like funny and interesting and it's you know he's, he's a great storyteller and so it's um yeah I, I was i was definitely pleasantly surprised by how much i i love this this comedy special it's really good sweet um yeah um he's <laughs> there's there's uh yeah I mean, it's it's mostly him about talking about his his like uh he, you know his, his issues with drug addiction and and going through that and going through rehab and um but he also talks about kind of how he views himself and how he treats like his relationship with the world and kind of his his like uh it's interesting. He kind of talks about how he's kind of more secure in himself, and he's like he's less about like trying to please other people as much. Um, and the 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 way he put it was like, uh, <laughs> he was like, uh, what? Yeah, what what are people going to do? Cancel John Mulaney? I almost killed him. <laughs> like, oh it's very like. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah it's, it's it's very dark but in a way that's like he's clearly like on the better side of this thing so he, he can joke about it well that's good it's anyway yeah it's very good so it's obviously it's 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 dark but it didn't feel like depressing or anything because it, it's like we know that there's a happy ending because he's in a good place now yeah because he's still alive yeah, so <laughs> correct <laughs> yeah um and he seems to be doing real well now well good cool um so yeah, definitely recommend that. Um, and yeah, that's kind of been the, the main things I've been up to. What about you, Sam? What have you been up to, media wise or otherwise? Um, I have been. I don't know if I remember mentioning last week. It's been a while, but um, still listening to Lord of the Rings audiobook. Um, yes. uh-huh. going for. I'm about the Andy Circus. The Andy, it's so good. I like forget that Andy Circus is narrating because he like does all of the voices so well like we just oh, yeah. like in the part i'm in we're at the um the council of elrond in rivendell and boromir just showed up and he sounds exactly like boromir like it's like oh Amazing. that's like it's like and like his like gandalf has always been perfect and his uh frodo and sam and mary and pippin they all sound exactly like the actors to play them in the movie it's just really cool and it's just very well done that's awesome the only time it's weird is like when there's a girl but it's lord of the rings says so like three times the entire story so <laughs> i was gonna say yeah, yeah. all three women yeah. in this book yeah it's it's yeah it's what it's, it's galadriel and it's uh uh, uh arwen Arwen, that's yeah. what I was thinking. And then, and then there's probably another one. I think Eowyn later, but also the movies skip out on uh Tom Bombadil and his wife Goldberry. Um Right, there's some girl hobbits. She's not Hobbit. She's yeah. she's the daughter no, of the go. she's the daughter of the river. And Tom Bombadil oh. is like kind of God. But not God, but like kind oh. of God. Yeah. I, yeah, this is an aspect of, of the Lord of the Rings I was not yeah. familiar with. Tom, I, like, I, Tom Bombadil is so fun, but he's just, like, the most, like, overpowered <laughs> character in, like, all of anything. But he's, like, <laughs> he's also just, like, very happy-go-lucky and, like, ADHD to, like, to a fault to, like, where I was, I was like, watching a YouTube video about Tom Bombadil. Because I was like, who the heck is this guy? Because like, I've read the book. This is like my second or third time reading The Fellowship of the Ring. I've never read all of the Lord of the Rings books. Because um, I always get through The Fellowship. And then I've gotten through The Two Towers once. And therefore I've gotten to The Return of the King once. And only ever gotten like three chapters in. And I just lose steam. And then I put it down. And then like I forget everything that I've read. And then I have to start over. <laughs> so... I'm in the starting over phase, but it's Andy Circus, and it's from the library. It's my Libby app, and so I oh, have like a oh, I have to read this now. Like I, I otherwise I'm like there's a line. Yeah, there's a line yeah. on these books, and so like I gotta 
I got to do it. Um, but basically, so like Tom Bombadil is probably like the most overpowered character in all of Lord of the Rings. Because uh, like he can just, <laughs> okay. he just like kind of just appears at will in places and like can just be he, like he sings and things happen. Right. So like Tolkien is very like Christian kind of like there's like a lot of like Christian undertones to it. But like it's not. Yeah. He like actively tried to not make it allegorical but just like kind of like the way he sees the world like it's kind of hard to not like have those sorts of things come in so like yeah. in i don't know like in the book of genesis like god speaks and things come into being tom bombadil sings mm-hmm. and the world obeys his singing right <laughs> yeah like so what what species is tom bombadil yes i don't know okay cool yeah Thanks. <laughs> um Maybe a man, but also he's older than time, so it doesn't. It doesn't. He's just Tom Bombadil. Okay, wow. I this whole time, like I thought, knowing very little about Tom Bombadil, I knew the name basically, and I kind of I thought he was a, like another Hobbit. Yeah, no, we're going to and we're going to Wikipedia on this. It sounds like a Hobbit name, doesn't it? Oh, it does. Tom Bombadil, but that's just Tolkien writing. <laughs> okay, Tom Bombadil. All right, let's read the official Lord of the Rings. Tom Bombadil wiki. Okay. So, he also, like, he never isn't singing in, like, anytime he's speaking, he's singing. So, there's that. And so, like, it kind of got annoying after a while because it was three chapters of Tom. It was, like, literally three hours worth of listening to Andy Serkis singing as Tom Bombadil. Uh, But Tom Bombadil was a mysterious being that lived for much of history of the world, being known in the Third Age to dwell in the Valley of... Withywindle in the depths of the old forest east of Buckland and close to the dangerous Barrow Downs. His domain was of modest size, but he seemed to possess an unequaled power over the land around his dwelling. He lived in a little house in the dingle of the old forest by the river Withywindle, together with his wife Goldberry, daughter of the river, far from any other settlement. Although seemingly benevolent, he took no open stance against the Dark Lords. So, basically, like, he's like... Because so, someone was, like, some, like, big, like, Tolkien fan was, like, reading, uh, was, like, explaining to his significant other, like, who Tom Bombadil was, and she was asking him, like, why doesn't, why don't they just, if he's this powerful, why don't they just give Tom the ring and just let him take care of it? And mm-hmm. because, like, he, like, could see, like, because Frodo, like, accidentally slips on the ring when he's, like, sitting with Tom and stuff, and it was, like, the first time he ever, like, wore the ring was, like, in Tom Bombadil's living room. And just, like, he just disappeared. Um, and Tom was like, you know I can see you, right? And, like, no one else could see. So, like, he could see <laughs> Frodo, even though, like, Frodo was wearing the ring. And then he's like, give me the ring. And Frodo's like, what? He's like, give it, just give me the ring. And he just holds it, he puts it on, doesn't disappear. He's like, oh, that's funny, and just gives it back to him. Like, the ring has <laughs> no power... Amazing. Over Tom Bombadil. So, like, Tom, like, he could handle the ring and just, like, but the thing with Tom is, like, he would, like, just forget that he had it. Like, you could just give it to him and, like, tell him to, like, take care of it. It's, like, he just throw it in a drawer somewhere. And then it was just, like, that's, like, God. yeah. That's so interesting. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's it's such a contrast to his name. Like, it's, it's such a silly name. It's, like, it's, like, if you were, like... <laughs> You, like, like you found out that, like, Billy Ray Cyrus was a god. It's like, oh. <laughs> All right. It's not what I would expect yeah. from what I know about that person. But Yeah. He, uh, he introduces himself by singing. Like, obviously, that's all he does is singing. But he says, old Tom Bombadil is a merry fellow. Bright blue is his jacket and his boots are yellow. That's how he introduces himself. Wow. He's just like, I have a blue hat and yellow boots. Like, that's me, but I'm yeah. singing about it. I should I should yeah. write a children's book about myself and sing it at people. In order yeah, to introduce myself. And then okay. his uh, his wife Goldberry is literally described as the most beautiful, like, feminine being in all of existence. Like, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Me, I'm gonna read. Where is the thing with Goldberry? Yeah, We're, we'll get to Star Wars eventually, y'all. But this is my current fandom obsession. <laughs> All right. This is the Tom Bombadil segment. Yep. Let's see. Her appearance. We'll just read this. There's a section on her appearance in the Lord of the Ring wiki. 
Uh, so Goldberry was as beautiful and youthful as an elf queen with long yellow hair that rippled down her shoulders, fair skin, clear voice that was as young and as ancient as spring, like the song of a glad water flowing down into the night from a bright morning on the hills. And she moved with a slender grace that delighted those who observed her. The hobbits also noted that she was always beautifully dressed. During their first meeting with her, her gown was green, as green as young reeds, shot with silver beads of dew, and her belt was of gold, shaped like a chain of flag lilies set with pale blue eyes of forget-me-nots. Later on, she was clothed in all, all in silver with a white girdle, and her shoes were like fish's mail. Frodo went on to reflect to himself that, while Goldberry's extreme beauty and lovely voice were similar to those of the elves, there's still a remarkable difference, for her charms were less keen and lofty than the elves, but also deeper and nearer to mortal heart, marvelous and yet not strange. So, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so, anyway, that's like one of the, th there are like only like three or four women in all of like <laughs> the Lord of the Rings, and they're all just like, like just these random, like one random woman, very beautiful, very like, like ob Tolkien obviously like holds women in high regard, but also like doesn't know how to write them, and so he doesn't. <laughs> I think I think that's that's like my opinion of Tolkien writing women. Like he holds them in incredibly high esteem, but has no idea how to write a female character, and so he just just does not write female characters. He's like, I, I yeah, I'm not I'm not qualified for this. <laughs> yeah, like like not because like he is like like you might think that he's just like wouldn't be like a misogynist and hates women. He's like, no, he like holds women in such high esteem that he literally doesn't know how to comprehend how to write them well. And so he just does not. <laughs> <laughs> He's never met a woman in his life. He's <laughs> That's my take. Well, all right. Anyway, cool. I'm reading a lot of the rings. It's fun. <laughs> And I'm tired, and so tangents abound. But anyway, we should probably... Uh, that's all I am up to Tangents lately. abound! Tangents abound, and impenetrable defense, etc., etc. Uh, but yeah. Um, tangents abound does sound like something that would begin one of the, the opening spiels. Yep. To, to a Clone Wars episode. Tangents abound! It does. Uh, speaking of tangents, yeah. I have another thing I want to tell you. Oh, I, did you see the thing okay. I sent you on Twitter? If you didn't, don't open it. Uh, okay, I don't think I did. I don't think so. Okay, cool. You you would know if you did. So, I saw a recent casting announcement about Sonic the Hedgehog 3. <gasps> what? Okay. The voice of Shadow the Hedgehog oh my God. is rumored to be Hayden Christensen. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know, I'm right? Sorry, what? <laughs> That's yeah. so perfect that I want it so I bad. Know. <laughs> I know! I <laughs> know! Uh, you better say something about sand. <laughs> you better write in a line for Shadow if, if, about how he hates sand. I feel like Sonic the Hedgehog is, like, just self-aware enough that it would. Yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. Ugh, yeah. that makes me so happy. I, I hope that's true. I so hope that's true. Yeah. Yeah. I know some yeah, people were, because, like, like, like a, like kind of a fan casting people had was, like, Adam Driver. I feel like he, he oh. might, might have been a good Shadow, which is another Star Wars connection. I could see it. You know. Kylo Ren. I can see it. Kylo Ren's shadow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he is. He is. Yeah. Guess control. Yep. That's awesome. Okay, That's no, that, amazing. That was my right? update. That was the thing I wanted to tell you about that. <laughs> it was a good update. I want to make sure. It was a quality update. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's the only Star Wars news I have. Is Hayden Christensen cool. might be Shadow the Hedgehog. Is there other Star yeah. Wars news? Uh, the other Star Wars news is we watched some episodes today about Boba Fett. That's cool. Did, uh, <gasps> Boba Fett. Bo Bo little Bobby. A little Boby. Baby Boba. Baby Boba. Boba Baby. Bouncing Baby Boba. A bouncing Baby. A good name for the episode. Bouncing, <laughs> bouncing Baby Boba. Baby Boba. <laughs> I'll take it. Yeah. A bouncing <laughs> Baby Brett. <laughs> we ready to, ready to get started? We ready to talk about this I episode? I think we are. All right. Let uh, us. Well, as I said before, we're talking about The Clone Wars. Season 2, episodes 20 through 22. Death Trap, R2 Come Home, and Lethal Track Down. Sam, where does these, where does this episode 6 place at Simon Lens? 21 BBY. 21 uh, big uh, baby, baby brat. Big baby Yoda. Big baby Yoda. Yep. All right. All uh, right. Let's, yeah, let's do it. Let's get into it. I gotta get. Hold on. Let me open Wikipedia. You can tell which which of the the little clone children is Boba Fett because he's the one that's angry all the time. Yep. He's also the one who looks exactly like he does in episode two. That's true. Like, yeah. Doesn't even change his hair. It's just like, yeah. Yeah, it's like he literally exactly <laughs> the same person. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, I guess I will, I will start with the, the summary yep. and whatnot. Okay. Um, so uh, the moral of this episode of Death Trap, the first episode of this arc, is who my father was matters less than my memory of him. Deep. All right. <clears throat> <clears throat> Calm before the storm. A rare and welcome respite from endless battle awaits Jedi Knights Anakin Skywalker and Mace Windu as they travel through deep space aboard the Jedi Cruiser Endurance. Preparing to rendezvous with a Republic frigate, the Jedi remain unaware of the deadly peril lying hidden in their midst. Dun, dun, dun. Right, Looks glasses. Are those, are those... Thanks. Are they new or are they just... You don't wear them much? They... Well, uh, neither. You wearing them. Neither. Okay. Well, I, was, they look nice I wasn't like wearing them just a minute ago. Thanks. <laughs> I need new ones. These are like two and a half years old, uh, and I need a new prescription. But now I just like I can't read anything without them anymore. So here we are. That's funny. Yep. I've been, I need some. I've been wanting to get some new glasses. Like my my prescription hasn't changed a ton, but it's changed enough to where I, I would like to get some new glasses. And I also just want to like get some new frames to kind of just you know change it up because I've had yeah. these frames for a few years and they're like they're kind of like. <laughs> loose and, and like fall not falling apart but like they're kind of dirty and like i just i want some new ones i want some fresh some fresh frames yeah. um but i've been waiting for like my my new like vision insurance card to come in the mail so i can actually do that hmm. um because i didn't have vision insurance last year uh but now i do uh anyway there you go uh all right <clears throat> anyway back to star wars <laughs> star wars all right a squad which, by the way, I, like this, the the word "squad" links to an article about squads, which is cool. just love it. Know. Anyway, all right, here we go. <laughs> a squad of chronologically six year old clones. Gosh, that's weird to think of. So they they look like they're like twelve or thirteen, but they're six because that's how it works. Anyway, yep. A squad. <laughs> I'm gonna stop stopping in the middle of sentences and actually read the summary now. A squad of chronologically six year old clones are briefed by a more experienced trooper en route to, on their journey to the Star Destroyer Endurance. Afterwards, several of the clones, each with different haircuts, tease their newest member, a, re- a young a young recruit who calls himself Lucky, actually Boba Fett, shh, <laughs> before being reprimanded by another clone who appears to be the group's leader. Upon arrival, the young soldiers are greeted by Jedi Generals Mace Windu and Anakin Skywalker. Subsequently, the clones are given opportunities to demonstrate their training through target practice using explosive skeet. The first two cadets miss the target. When Ad- Admiral Killian notices the look in Boba's eyes, he orders him onto the turret. The clone gunner deploys one explosive ski, which who Boba destroys who, which Boba destroys with precise accuracy. The clone they did say they were believes, droids. They said they were droids. So that is true. Yeah, like like malfunctioning droids, but they don't look like droids. They just look like little like like clay pigeon ski things. Jack, droids is people's too. Droids is people's too. Yes, if 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 Star Wars has established anything with consistency, it's that droids are definitely people, right? Uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, which, which Boba destroys the precise accuracy. The clone gunner believes that he got lucky <laughs> and sends out uh-huh. three skeets in separatist attack formation. Boba destroys all three, surprising the gunner. As the cadets leave for the observation deck, Killian expresses his admiration for Boba's talents to the gunner. Resuming their tour of can the I just, ship, Boba... Can, 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 can I just say that, like, love how Boba is not even, like, trying to hide the fact that he's, like, that much better than everyone. Like, he's not even, like, trying to blend in, like, off. one of the kids. Yeah. He's just like, I am the best at this, and y'all suck. Look at me. I'm the best. By the way, I'm stealth. I'm definitely not one of you guys. <laughs> I am stealthy, but I'm yeah. the best. But I'm he's stealthy, all this but st- I'm yeah. the best. Yes, he's supposed to be, like, super undercover... But actually, he's just, yeah, consistently showing off and also just has this constant angry brooding expression on his face. And is just very determined all the time while all the other clone kids are like looking around at like, the, the the interior of the Star Destroyer. And being like, ooh, wow, whoa. Meanwhile, he's like, <laughs> like clearly wants to kill somebody. <laughs> you know? Yeah. One of these 12 year olds is not like the other. <laughs> Can you spot which one wants to murder a Jedi? Hmm. Hmm. All right. Resuming the tour of the ship, Boba quickly strays away from his group and manages to bluff his way into Mace Windu's quarters, where he stealthily installs a bomb triggered by stepping through a laser in the doorway. As Mace enters his quarters, he is soon called off for another meeting and instead 
orders a clone to go inside to drop something off for him. The clone sets off the trap, killing him. The entire ship is placed under alert, and as a result, Boba is instructed via comlink to sabotage the reactor core and thus kill everyone, although he exhibits some hesitation. Boba then once again snakes away from his group, but ends up being caught by an unsuspecting trooper who decides to call for security. After a brief scuffle, Boba managed to defeat the trooper in a brawl. He overpowered the clone and stunned the clone with his own blaster and shoots the core command console. Much of the hull is immediately destroyed in an explosion, and the Jedi are almost sucked into space before the gaping holes are sealed off. Realizing that endurance is critically damaged beyond repair, the Jedi and most of the surviving crew then choose to abandon ship. However, Killian stubbornly refuses and stays on board along with Pongs. The young clones, including Boba, are then jettisoned in an escape pod. Boba sabotages the pod he is in, causing it to drift off away from the others. Eventually, the pod is discovered by Slave One, with Aura Singh and Bosk on board. We've got Bosk now. Bosk is here. That's neat. Love that. Uh, Boba is revealed to be responsible for the destruction of the Endurance, and is given the choice by Singh to go with the clones or go with them. Boba sides with the bounty hunters, muttering an apology to the cadets. Jack states that he'll regret it. As Boba enters the Slave One, Aura releases the pod into space. Mere seconds after Slave One leaves, Anakin and Mace arrive to find the cadets unharmed. Meanwhile, Admiral Killian attempts to land the badly damaged endurance upon the surface of the nearby planet Vancor. End of episode one. You did it! Yay! Sorry, my internet skits out, but we're here. Yay! Yep. Yeah. Well, this is, this is an interesting episode in that, like, I mean, it's it's our first time seeing Boba Fett since Attack of the Clones, I think, right? Um, yes. Yeah, so... It, yeah, th- th- this is, like... Yeah, like, throughout the Clone Wars, we get more and more of, of like... There are several arcs involving, Boba, like, young Boba Fett and his, like, journey to becoming the bounty hunter that we all know. Um... But it's yeah, it's it's interesting, I, and I think like with the the further context of like of the book of Boba Fett, um, you know, I, I think some some people like in, in watching the book of Boba Fett were kind of like frustrated that like Boba Fett seemed to be kind of like a peace loving guy, or like you know he, he yeah. wasn't like the kind of the, the savage warrior that people wanted him to be, maybe. But like right. with you know looking back at these episodes with this context, you can see that like you know there was a point at which you know. Boba was like hesitant to just like you know indiscriminately kill people <laughs> you know he's, he's like yeah yeah it, it, it comes from his, his like his his anger and his like you know his, his violence comes from a place of like frustration and trauma and not from a place of like he's not just like an asshole for the sake of being an asshole or he's not like right. selfish he's like yeah you know like like, he, like he was, if all you yeah. know of if all you know of Boba Fett is like episodes five and six like, it makes sense why you're upset that Book of Boba Fett was the way it was. But, mm-hmm. like, if you watch the other stuff, it makes a lot of sense. Like, no. Mm-hmm. Context is important for these sorts of things. Yeah. And th- yeah. this is the first time I've gone back to to see any of these, like, early, like, Baby Boba episodes uh, post-seeing yeah. the Book of Boba Fett. Um, so, it, yeah, it, it adds some, like, like, in hindsight, it adds more context. That makes me kind of appreciate right. the book of that a little more. Um, that's cool. Um, yeah. So there you go. Uh, yeah. I guess we do, do want to move on to the next episode. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. The next episode of this arc, while well, this loads, is uh, episode 21 of season two of. Star Wars The Clone Wars is titled R2 Come Home and the moral is adversity is a friendship's truest test. True, true. Revenge! Boba Fett, son of the notorious bounty hunter Jango Fett, infiltrated a Jedi cruiser in an attempt to assassinate General Mace Windu, the man who killed his father. After a near miss at Windu's quarters, Boba was forced to destroy the cruiser and escape with the help of the notorious Bounty Hunter Aura Singh. Now, having lost contact with Admiral Killian, when his doomed starship crashed, the Jedi searched for survivors with the aid of a Republic rescue ship. All right. Here we go. So, the Ventnor class Star, Dest- the Ventnor class Star Destroyer Endurance has crashed on the planet Vancor after the sabotage caused by a young Boba Fett in his quest to kill Jedi Master Mace Windu. Hoping that Admiral Killian, Commander Pons, and others may still be alive, Windu and Anakin Skywalker 
transfer the survivors to a Republic medical ship before heading down to the planet to look for survivors. Skywalker points out that coming that upon coming across the ship that when it while it is in terrible shape, the bridge appears to be in one piece. The two Jedi is set down behind the ship, at which point R2 D2 beeps that he has a bad feeling about this place. Windu chastises Skywalker for encouraging individuality in his droid. Windu, Skywalker, R2, and RB, R8B7 proceed to the ship, unaware of Gundarks following them. Once inside, the Jedi discover a grim scene. R2 has turned a corner and come upon a clone trooper lying face down in the rubble. The clone was clearly dead, but Mace was unsure of the cause of death, so he inspected the body, flipping the deceased clone onto his back. Upon seeing the trooper's front, the Jedi then saw that the trooper did not die in the crash. Rather, the clone's dirty armor bore a large, distinctive scorch mark on his chest plate that resulted from a blaster wound placed precisely through the trooper's heart. The clone didn't die in the crash. Rather, he had survived and was killed when he was found and shot by an unknown assassin. The Jedi realized that they had come upon an execution. Skywalker also notices that the body of another clone was, trooper was laying nearby, killed by a similar blaster wound to the heart. Dazed and already wounded from the crash, the troopers stood little chance and would have been easy victims for the unknown killer. Windu theorizes that those who tried to assassinate him may have come down looking for his body. When they came across surviving clone troopers, they killed them. The droids are sent to search for survivors while the Jedi head to the bridge. In the process of their search, R2 and R8 are attacked by a pair of gun darks. R8 is ripped apart, and R2 is knocked across the floor. Poor R8. Gone too Poor soon. R8. Gone too soon. Gone but not forgotten. In the arms of an angel. <laughs> On the bridge! There it is. There it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, Windu and Skywalker discover more bodies of more clones who stayed behind to try and land the ship, including two navigational officers. However, they were again too late. The assassin had beat the Jedi to the bridge and had already killed every clone on the bridge. The blaster wounds on their bodies revealed they were executed in the same manner as the two clones found earlier, but note there's no sign of the Admiral or Pons. Windu reports this to the medical ship in orbit, which proceeds to leave for the nearest Republic medical station. Noticing a Mandalorian helmet sitting on a piece of rubble, Skywalker advances. Windu spotted the helmet. Then he turned his attention to one of the dead clones lying on the ground before him. The clone laid on his back with one hand outstretched and the other draped over his stomach. This unfortunate trooper had lost his helmet in the crash. The clone's eyes were closed and Mace saw that the assassin had shot the trooper in the chest plate and through his heart, killing him. The clone's face reminded Windu of Jango Fett, the template for the clone army, whom he killed at the end on Geognosis, and then remembers his son, Boba, who watched his father die at Windu's hands. Too late, Windu uses the Force to pull Skywalker away from the helmet, which explodes, severely damaging the bridge and causing debris to rain down on Gundarks that were advancing on R2. One is killed, while the other flees. I had a thought about this. Oh yeah, why did he just, like, leave his dad's helmet? Like, just on the bridge. You've frozen for me, Sam. Jackie, there. Oh, no. What's happening again? Sam? My Wi-Fi. This isn't going as planned. Nothing to see here. All right, we're back at it. <laughs> we we just stopped recording for, like, like 10 minutes because Sam's Wi-Fi crapped out or something. Yeah, I don't we know what happened. Computer. Yeah. But now we're back. Yeah, because I think I stopped. Let's get back at it. I stopped to, like, talk about, like, why did he... Did he bring his dad's helmet and then use his dad's helmet as a weapon? Because yeah. those... Because we know from, like, The Mandalorian that those are hard to come by. Like, that's Beskar. Like, you don't just, yeah. like... Mm -hmm. You don't just, like, use Beskar as, like, a maybe he'll trip on this landmine kind of trap. <clears throat> you yeah. know? I also think that, like... I I mean, the, the armor that, like that Boba wears later on is supposed to be, like, Jango Fett's armor. Like, like, like repainted, repainted yeah. So, like... So, so what, yeah, so what like, was this? Did, that, did he get the helmet back at some point? Like, what happened? Or is this a decoy helmet? Was it just, a, a, like, one of one of, one of Jango's spare helmets? Did know? Jango have a spare helmet? That's awesome. If he did. Who knows? <laughs> I don't know. He's yeah. got Beskar lying around everywhere. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> All right. In yep. the yep. distance... Are we good? We're good. Great. In the distance, Ara Singh... In the 
<laughs> in a building. Uh, Aris, in a building. <laughs> Arasing, Bosk, Boba, and Castus watch the explosion with satisfaction. Boba insists on finding Wendy's body, but his companions initially refuse, stating they have enough to sell Count Dooku with the three with their three hostages, Admiral Killian, Commander Pons, and a navigation officer. In the end, Aura and Boba win out, leaving Bosk to guard the hostages as they head to the downed ship. R2, now realizing that the Jedi may be in danger, heads to the bridge and finds Windu unconscious and Skywalker wounded, both trapped under rubble. As the droid continues to move the debris, he causes the bridge to shudder, and Skywalker warns him against it. Instead, he, ins- he instructs his droid to head back to the Jedi Starfighters and send a message to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant for help. R2 proceeds to leave the bridge, but spots the bounty hunters approaching, and instead decides to try to halt their advance. He first pushes debris down a tunnel, uh, down a tunnel the bounty hunters are climbing through, and then closes the doors on them. When they come up another tunnel, he pushes yet more debris and boxes on them before detaching a grenade from a dead clone and dropping it down the tunnel. Deterred, Aura declares that they will instead use Slave One to destroy the remains of the ship, thereby ensuring the Jedi's death. R2 then proceeds to the Jedi Starfighters, but is accosted on the way by the remaining Gundark. Using quick thinking, the droid attaches attaches the Gundark via cable to one of the Starfighters and activates the fighter's engines crashing it some miles away and killing the Gundark. Having witnessed the explosion and realizing that it came from came near the Jedi Starfighters, the Bounty Hunters believe that Windu has survived and jam all communications before heading to the location of the Starfighters in Slave 1. R2 activates the remaining Starfighter and pilots it away from the Slave 1, now shooting at it and into the atmosphere. Seeing this, Windu states that his astromech was meant to get help, not abandon them, but Anakin returns his faith in R2. Avoiding the blast fire from Slave 1, the astromech droid gets into space, but its communication device is destroyed. The only solution now is to use hyperdrive rings to get to Coruscant. Realizing the droid's plan, Boba fires at the hyperdrive rings, but succeeds only in destroying one, allowing R2 to use the other to escape. Aura states not to worry, as she can draw Windu to her using the hostages. Before Slave 1 makes the jump to hyperspace. On Coruscant, R2 interrupts a meeting with Plo Koon's droid and replays Anakin's message to several other Jedi. Plo Koon, Ahsoka Tano, and Corporal Comet, along with Commander Wolf, make their way to Vancourt with rescue ships. They help the injured Jedi just as the bridge of the Endurance collapses. While being loaded onto the rescue ships on stretchers, Mace compliments R2 on his bravery, and Anakin jokes that it is more praise than Windu ever gave him. End of the second episode. Yay. Yay. This was a very cool R2 centric episode. Um I love yes. how just like now R2 was able to like think on his feet so much and like improvise on top of improvising on top of improvising. Like this is no ordinary droid. This is R2 D2 we're talking about. Like it's just like th- yeah. like like it, R2 really shows <laughs> how like crucial of like a team player he is to anything he's involved in yeah it's always great whenever we get a a, an r2 highlighting episode and whenever we get a a moment where uh an astromech gets the chance to to kick some ass to be (laughs) be be a cool action hero basically and save the day yeah and not do it by being a war criminal chopper i mean that's fun sometimes chopper (laughs) <laughs> oh man but yeah definitely it's and good. and at the end we get uh Plo we do Plo get Plo Koon Plo and Ahsoka Plo and Ahsoka and then we get some of our favorites in this next episode Jack are you ready are you ready I'm so ready dude we get one of my favorite surprises to ever be surprised by in this next episode it's 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 the best kind of surprise it truly is yeah Jack take us away let's do it all right, so the moral of this last episode, called Lethal Takedown, is revenge is a confession of pain. That's a good moral. I like that one. That, that's, that is this, a good this moral. Good. I appreciate that one. <clears throat> Lethal Trackdown. The young Boba Fett has taken the law into his own hands and made two attempts at the life of Mace Windu, the Jedi Master who killed his father. Boba's mentor, bounty hunter Ara Singh, has taken three Republic officers hostage in an effort to force Windu to face Boba on their terms, a tactic that does not sit well with the young vigilante. 
While Anakin Skywalker and Mace Windu recover the Jedi Temple in Coruscant, they suddenly receive a transmission from Aura Singh in which she reveals the bounty hunters are holding Admiral Killian, Clone Commander Pons, and another clone officer hostage before ruthlessly executing Pons and taunting the Jedi to track her down. With no leads as to Singh's location, Master Plo Koon and Ahsoka Tano venture into Coruscant's underworld in hopes of obtaining information from various members of the underworld. Unfortunately, they experienced a little luck, due in part to Ahsoka's impatience and lack of subtlety during the investigation. Love I love the conversation they have where, like, <laughs> like, uh, yeah, uh, Plo says something to Ahsoka along the lines of, you know, you've learned a lot from your master, including his penchant for, like, a, a lack of subtlety. Yeah. Like, he's, yeah, it's great. Uh, all right. Meanwhile, the bounty hunters start to argue aboard Slave 1. Castus complains that the job had become far too risky and convoluted, especially as the Jedi Order is now on their tracks. To further complicate things, Boba Fett suffers from a guilty conscience as he feels the prisoners have nothing to do with his quest for revenge on Mace Windu. His relationship with the other bounty hunters, especially Aura, begins to deteriorate, deteriorate further after Boba refuses to, to personally execute Commander Pons during the transition to the Jedi. Finally, the bounty hunters make course for Florum, in hopes of obtaining aid and refuge from Aura's former lover, who is none other than the weak, weak wave pirate Hondo Onaka. Hondo Yay, Onaka! Hondo. While Hondo hospitably invites Aura for a drink, he nonetheless firmly refuses to provide any assistance, although he also promises to not stand in their way. Castus takes the opportunity to speak with a fellow bounty hunter in Coruscant via hologram and offers to provide information on his fellow bounty hunters. However, his conversation is overheard by Aura Singh, who then executes Castus on the spot in front of a horrified Boba. You know, I... I <laughs> at, the, at the beginning of these episodes, when we met the, the group of bounty hunters, I was like, hmm, I wonder which one of these bounty hunters is going to end up dying. Could it maybe be the one that doesn't appear in a movie later? It's... <laughs> <laughs> you know? Where does Aura it's Singh like... show up? Because I... Like, I've recognized her from... Mm -hmm. Um... I'm trying to remember where yeah let me hold on let me just like look at her because her wikipedia article, is a live so it's it's like a live action picture of her yeah i don't know if she was she was actually in something or if she like was like a deleted uh, scene like, or something yeah she was like a deleted scene character um let me look behind the scenes let's see um <laughs> the character of Aura Singh was first conceived in a sketch labeled babe fett <laughs> by lucasfilm's <laughs> doug <Dungeon. laughs> wow great cool um uh let's see let's see so it looks like um so george lucas wanted more characters to fill out the pod racing sequence in the phantom menace um and so she was just like a background character it looks like um oh. yeah because they referred to it as a cameo appearance yeah yeah i guess maybe she doesn't i guess she doesn't appear well she appears later in 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 later uh clone wars episodes so we know she yeah. survives this but but i do recognize yeah. her from uh and i'm seeing like this the still from the boon to eve and i do recognize i do recognize her mm -hmm. so yeah. that's cool um but i also like that because she's boba fett's mentor and is hondo's ex that hondo is kind of boba fett's like cool kindly ex stepfather <laughs> kind of yeah, yeah 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 who's like way safer than like his like acting mother like she's like <laughs> yeah yeah. yeah she's scary yeah you know it yeah it's it's not a good sign when your the, the best like parental figure in your life is Hondo and Hondo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah ruh <laughs> ro mm. ooh ooh <laughs> all right anyway anyway yeah uh all right meanwhile the two jedi make their way into another Coruscant cantina Plo Koon advises Ahsoka to be more subtle and attentive to small details. Coincidentally, Ahsoka manages to eavesdrop on a conversation in which Castus' friend mentions the bounty hunter's activities on Florum before being confronted by a large group of thugs. Plo Koon and Ahsoka are forced to draw their lightsabers and manage to leave after a tense standoff. Sooner, soon afterward, the two Jedi arrive on Florum and make their way into a cantina, empty save for the presence of Aura at one of the tables. Aura tries to extract a ransom from the Jedi Master, revealing that she is holding the remaining two hostages at different locations, and that they will be executed by Bosk if she gave the word. Both sides then spring their traps, with Boba holding a blaster to Kuhn's head, while Tano destroys Aura's comlink and holds a lightsaber to her throat. The bounty hunters manage to make a diversion and escape, but Boba is captured at the last second while Aura leaves on an airspeeder with Ahsoka in close pursuit. 
Plo Koon then interrogates Fed, who stubbornly refuses to disclose the hostage's location. Hondo finally manages to persuade Boba by reminding him how Jango would have wanted his son to do the honorable thing. Ahsoka learns of the Admiral's location via comlink and manages to help subdue Bosk only seconds before the hostages are to be executed. However, Aura arrives a few moments later and manages to take off in Slave 1. Ahsoka clings onto the ship and even slices off one of its stabilizers with her lightsaber, causing the bounty hunter to lose control and crash in a fiery explosion. Which, Slave 1 survives that somehow. It's, it's the second thing of Boba Fett's that, that has, like, yeah, blown up but comes back later. Yeah, because <laughs> I don't even think this is the last time we see Slave 1 in the Clone Wars. Like, I think it comes back later, yeah. Yeah, like, I think it comes back yeah. in this series. Like, I know we see it in Book of Boba Fett, and also, like, yeah. in the original Star Wars trilogy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But mm-hmm. that that definitely, yeah. yeah, it's definitely there. So, yeah, it blows up. Also, yeah, yeah, speaking of things that blow up that, that end up being fine later, or a thing shows up again later, oh, yeah. despite blowing up with the ship. But... Yeah. yeah, she she suffers from what we would call too cool to get written off. That's what that's yes. what she has. <laughs> yeah, too it's interesting of a thing. Yeah, it's pl- it's like plot armor, but she's it's just coolness. Yeah, coolness factor. It's like this is a- that, that, that's what that's what Darth Maul had too. <laughs> exactly. It's like we <laughs> realized after we killed off this character that the character design was way too cool to be killed off, and therefore, mm. for reasons, they're back. <laughs> Reasons. Yes. All right. The final scene depicts Boba and Bosk in custody, arriving on Coruscant, where they are met by Mace Windu. Boba apologizes for the destruction he has caused, but insists he would never forgive Mace for killing Jango before being taken away. End of the episode. End of the arc. Yay! Here we go. Love it. Yeah, love it, love it, love it. It was yeah, that was a good episode. It was it was uh. I'd like the kind of the, the back and forth sort of intrigue with mm. like mm-hmm. the, the kind of negotiation, the hostage negotiation situation. Um, I like the, the kind of detective work. We get to see a little bit of a, it's always nice to see Plo and it's always, always nice to see Plo and Ahsoka together. Oh yeah. It's a, it's a, a fun, pleasant pairing, you know? Um, and we got to see more, like more insight into, into Boba as a character and like, uh, it's, I don't know, it's just sad that that Aura kind of abandons him, and he's like, "No, she left." <laughs> Such a sad moment. It is, you know. Um, but uh, and now Boba's in prison. Yeah. Yep, he's in juvie, and he'll he's never in... escape. I'm sure. Yep, yep. We all know that <laughs> Boba's in juvie. We all know that juvie at like on Coruscant is one of the most secure places ever, for sure. <laughs> yeah, of course. That's why we never see Boba Fett again. Yeah. This is the last we ever. He definitely doesn't get his own television series. <laughs> yeah, nope. <laughs> it's just it's it's an in prison procedural. That's all it really is. It's just it's him like just like it's like uh, you know throwing a ball against the wall repeatedly for half an hour. Yeah, for twelve episodes or whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Occasionally he works on his stand up, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, I I thought it was cool. Like again, we kind of like. Speaking of kind of insights into Boba as a character and his like backstory and kind of his like how much he values the idea of honor, despite the fact that he spent yeah. most of his life being kind of a ruthless bounty hunter, we see in this moment like like where uh, he eventually tells them where the hostages are because Hondo appeals to his sense of honor and his, like his, his uh, you know the, the the fact that he thinks his his father would have wanted him to do the honorable thing and that would be the honorable thing right which is yeah it's a cool moment and also it's it's another it's another cool hondo moment i think because again it's like he's a pirate and a a scoundrel and a scumbag but also he has like a code he has a sense of honor yeah which is more than can be said for a lot of the other like kind of the scum and villainy of the star wars universe indeed which is which is one of the reasons why he's such a great character yeah hondo Yeah, it's good. Good, well, good set of episodes. Good. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um. Well. Uh. Do you have a favorite part of this episode, Sam? These episodes, this arc. Uh, jump scare Hondo is always one of my favorite things. <laughs> jump scare Hondo. 
Yeah. It's like, oh, oh my it's God, a Zod episode. <laughs> awesome. My favorite boy. Yeah. There he is. Uh, but R2 being R2 is also always great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that was cool. But there wasn't like, there wasn't like one standout. It's just like a good set of episodes, but also kind of like all blends together in my brain. Like plot yeah. wise. Yeah, I, I, I get that. Mm-hmm. And so I don't know if I could like say one was better than the other or like this one part, but like I think the most like the moments that made me the happiest was definitely like Honda showing up and R2 like escaping the bounty hunters to get to Coruscant and then just like yes. drunkenly stumbling into the Jedi temple to like <laughs> he, he does he just like he goes Whoa! and then just like flies in and falls over and Yeah. As <laughs> yeah. R2 is wont to do. Yes. Excellent. Love that. We love an R2 <laughs> scream sprint into a wall to get people's attention. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I wish, I wish I could make that sound. Yeah. Here, I'll put it in right now. <laughs> if I remember to put it in. Do it. You there won't. Is. Anyway. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I also kind of have trouble coming up with like a favorite part. Um, I think, I guess... Just because it's like an interesting character moment, I'll say that that moment where uh, Hondo's like, "Tell them where the hostages are," because it's the honorable thing to do. That was that was a good moment. Yeah. It's a good moment. It's good. It's Hondo, yeah. and it's a it's a good character moment, and yeah. So I guess we'll go with that. Um, there's, there's a good set of episodes, but like you said, there's not like there aren't a ton of moments where I think like, "Oh, that was like a standout moment." Yeah, it was just you know, yeah, it was good. We did get a Wilhelm scream. Um, where I, I missed that. Where was that? It was, I think, when they, when it was the first episode when Boba like blew up, like the reactor, and a couple clones got sucked mm-hmm. out into space. There was like some uh... distorted. It was it was definitely like a distorted Wilhelm scream, but mm-hmm. I think it, I'm pretty confident it was a Wilhelm scream. Gotcha. That's cool. Good Wilhelm scream. That's fun. Yep. Um. Main character kills. Uh, I would have to think about like. I mean, Boba probably killed. Did did Boba kill anybody? I mean, I I mean he he like he he blew up the ship. But I mean, like he he killed that clone trooper thinking it was Mace Windu. Like he, oh, he did uh-huh. he did kill a clone trooper. Okay, so he killed at least. One. He has one confirmed. Yeah, one confirmed kill, and. Well, and then we can probably, there's at least two clones that got sucked out into space. So that's, I say give Boba three. Mm-hmm. Okay, sure. They all came in that I'm, first episode. I don't care enough to actually go back and count, so I will Everything's say. Everything's made up works. and the points don't matter. <laughs> and if somebody yes. who was paying attention enough while they were watching the episodes along with wants to correct us, we will, uh, they can call in in our corrections portion of the call-in section <laughs> and correct they can yeah so and we may or may not play it on the podcast depending on how embarrassed we want to feel yep. and how nice we feel about your voicemail yep anyway <laughs> um mvp uh i feel like there's an obvious answer here but what do you think sam uh i think the mvp yeah i don't know i don't know if i think there's an obvious answer I believe that you think there's an obvious answer. I don't know what <laughs> yeah. it would be. I mean, like, there's the R2 episode. R2, I think, is the MVP of that episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hondo be the MVP of the third episode. But what do you thought? You have... You I came just, out very I confidently. Mean, my, my <laughs> I'm also just tired, so maybe that's why I'm like, cool. yeah, that works. I love it. <laughs> Go for it. Uh... I was just thinking Boba, because right, it's, yeah. it's, obviously this is a Boba-centric arc, and he, you know, he, he doesn't, like, I, I wouldn't say he deserves MVP for, like, doing anything particularly amazingly, but just because, almost because I feel bad for him. <laughs> like, yeah. he's, like, he, you know, he, he's MVP to me because he, like, is, like, a, he, he does do some cool stuff. Yes. But also, he is, like, you know, going through some, like... He's going through some stuff, and, and we get to see a little bit of kind of character growth from him, and, you know... Yeah. So, that, that that's my argument. I like it. I support it. 
Uh, more Star Wars is better Star Wars. How does this episode make movies and the rest of Star Wars better, Sam? Uh, Boba Fett's backstory. That's, yep. yeah. Yep. And also more that, Hondo that, is that, better that, Hondo. Is yes, more Hondo is is better Hondo, and more uh, better Hondo is more Hondo is better Star Wars. Yes, something, something. Yeah, yeah we're tired. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. <laughs> yes, I'm. I'm. I'm like we're I'm sleepy gonna, boys. I want to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> sleepy boys. That's the alternate title for this episode. Is sleepy boys. Yep. All right. Um. Well, uh, if you'd like to join the discussion by by correcting our our probably many mistakes. Or by, you know, having a question or a comment or whatever, uh, leave a voicemail at 512-850-6653. Uh, and we might feature your comments, questions, or corrections on the podcast. Uh, join us for our next episode when we will be talking about the Clone Wars Season 3. We're in Season 3, like, actually now. Uh, season 3, Episode uh, 5 and 6, Corruption and the Academy. So that'll be cool. Um, Ooh. yeah, so we're, we're moving into to season. We, we've had like I think one or two episodes from season three already because Clone Cats, I think, is like oh, the first yeah. episode of season three. It's a flashback yeah. arc. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah, so we had a uh, yeah, season three, episode one, Clone Cadets, and season three, episode three, Supply Lines already. Mm. Um, but this is us like properly moving into season three. Nice. Next week. So that'll be that'll be exciting, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, well. Uh, I think we're gonna leave and go sleep and or eat food. I'll probably do both. Of yeah, things. it's Betty by time. Betty by time. I hope you get water back soon. Sam. So do I. That'd be great. I would love to have water. I'm glad you're house. home in, in 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 warmth. But I yeah, yeah, water would also be good. Yeah, the heater's yeah. keeping up. Let's see how much has the heater caught up. Are we caught up? Uh, update. Hey, where well, it's officially sixty eight degrees in my house. Love that. Hey. Love that. Huzzah. It was 65 when I started recording the episode, so that's really good. Well, Jack Ford. Sam Ford. I'm going to bid you good night. All right. Good night, everybody. And may the force be with you all and uh, stay warm. And uh, yeah. Don't do spice. Tired. Don't do spice. <laughs> all right. Bye, everybody. All right. Cut the chatter. Roger, Roger. <laughs>